Yo, 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 what is going on, COD Familia? It is your boy BN, aka Mr. Kingdom Builder. And today I wanted to talk about what I consider to be a pretty hot topic right now is about how there was a pretty strong movement for a number of people in the community that were advocating for returning to the Season 1 Plus map slash the Season 1 map. And this was from after, really started, I think, after Season 2. Started getting a lot more traction from Season 2 to 2+. Two and 2+, I think we saw, we saw really a kind of a crescendo of support from quite a few people that were really pushing this perspective of that, hey, you know, the Season 1 map, Season 1 Plus map was the best. I mean, heck, I even did a video on this a while ago talking about my map preferences that I liked. It wasn't to say that any of the current maps were bad or were poor. It was more of what I enjoyed out of the maps, specifically because of how the design was implemented at the time. And bear in mind, this was before Season 2 Plus came out, and then now we get the Season 2 Plus Plus, which is the T1 season, essentially a revised Season 1 Plus map. And I wanted to talk about that, because to me, there's usually two sides, right? Sometimes you hear the thing where it's like, yeah, there's two sides and then the truth. And the biggest hurdle, and I think the biggest challenge right now, is that it's not all about the map design. And that may be hard for some people to swallow that pill in that there's a lot more to it on why it is specifically because you have to understand why did people why were people really advocating for this well they were advocating for this because they felt that you know what we got we had the best pvp experience we had the best kvk playing experience throughout the duration of the season in one plus and then players for those that are advocating for it are hoping that bringing back this map design will kind of return us to whether you want to call it the glory days or if you just want to call it hey we're going to get a lot more action out of these maps now but a big reason that you have to understand on why was it specifically that these maps saw levels of success that we're just not consistently seeing as much right now with some of the newer seasons it has nothing to do necessarily <clears throat> with that the new season maps are bad there are opportunities there, of course, but the biggest reason why the Season 1 Plus map worked as well as it did in the beginning is mainly because when Season 1 came out, and I'm going to show you this and give you an example here. So let's go and take a look at exactly what we're talking about. So I have this channel that's on my, oh look, is that Nefesto? Oh, he just reached out to me. Um, <clears throat> we'll read that later. But the reason why, and I have this channel on my Discord, it's called Data Dump, where I screenshot all of the overhead maps, and then if I remember to do it on the actual scout camp, so we can get a direct overhead, even though I can pretty much get it from going to Behemoth 2 as well. You can see that I have all these documented, so you can see like what did the actual Season 1 map look when I took this back March 26th um, of 2023, right, at, at the time almost a year ago. And you can see this was like the original design for the map. If you look, I have vanilla overheads for Zone 1 in Season 1, which, again, you can still see. But then we get to Season 1 Plus. And the biggest difference really here in 1 Plus is that they made the Zone 1 neutrals uh, an area where you have specifically, or I should say you have, you have some of the Zone 1 regions were neutral zones. So... How we view it here, and I'll kind of show you, I can show you briefly on the map. So, when you started here, you had Kaltia, uh, and then you had, or excuse me, right, you had, uh, Kaltia was the neutral. So, Burning Lands was actually here, and it was Burning, Kaltia was the neutral, and then you had Sephrostia, Nivola was the neutral, then you had Daralyn, and Forgotten Lands was the neutral, right? And then you had Zoland. So you had four starting regions and three neutrals. That's really all they did, right? They kept the Season 1 map, and they just made Kaltia, Nivola, and Forgotten Lands the neutral zones, meaning you had four starting regions, and then you would go into the neutrals to go and fight, 
right? Obviously, they've done a little bit of renaming and a little bit of a map adjustment here, along with what they did for Zone 2, even though Zone 3 is pretty still much relatively untouched. And those were some of the biggest changes that ended up happening. However, if we look at the images that we have here, you can see Burning Lands, right? now is able to access if you remember in season one this was blocked off you weren't able to go west westward from burning lands and then opposite you weren't able to go from kaltia into burning lands from going west to east this just was not possible um, the other thing that you'll probably notice as we skadoosh our way over in kaltia now you have this zone four pass right this was something that they added in in one plus if you remember you were not able to access zone three from zone one in the original season one map they added this in as an adjustment going into one plus so it was the neutral zones and the passes those are pretty much more or less the two biggest things that impacted and so now we end up kind of coming back full circle to why is it exactly that the maps themselves do not really define how much pvp action you're going to get on a map and this is where you have to start digging into the player psychology aspects and you really have to start understanding the game at a fundamental level but also you need to immerse yourself if you do not take time out of your day to study to educate to research and to ask the most important questions or just to ask questions in general to where you can start getting a better understanding this is where it leads to things like misunderstandings or misinterpretation or misinformation to spread on why is it that the maps are not uh, or, or you know people blaming the maps so to speak right and i may blow some people's minds here but the other part you have to understand and i'm going to back this up with data too as well the other part you have to understand is that diplomacy and the way that alliance slash kingdom diplomacy or diplo as we refer to it for short is handled is one of the most major factors that will determine how much PvP is actually going to play out in a KVK. And it's very easy. If you end up, and I'll give you a great example, right? We're in the T1 season right now. If I was to say, or if we end up seeing alliances that load up into one zone, and then we have alliances that load up into an opposite zone, well, they're not going to probably see each other until the final zone, which in this case would be zone four. Do you think that that's going to be fun? Do you think that this these alliances, these players are going to be able to enjoy PvP throughout the season? No. Now, whether or not they view that as fun or not is obviously subjectively up to each of them. But I would imagine that most alliances would love to have some action throughout the season, right? Especially if that action is not impacting they're playing in a way that uh, disallows them or does not allow for them to get to the final zone, right? And so then we have to look at, okay, well, why is this happening? And, and again, here's where we'll look at some data. So if we take a look at the T1 season, right? I'll show you this, this is on my uh, risk it to get the biscuit sheet. It's my private sheet that I'm gonna show you now. So let's look at an example here. So let's take a look at like the TFS, EXG, EXXL, BXS, EIS, RTG, right? So this is ST14 from 23. So we're going to look at this group, right? So let's go T1. We'll go ST14 starting with 23. Uh, oh, gosh, I forgot. I can't actually observe this one yet. That's okay. We're going to do it like this. I'll show this to you guys on my scout. And I'll make it 10 times easier here. So we're going to skadoosh this bad boy over. And I'm going to give you a great example here once this loads up. And I'm going to explain as well why this is happening and why it is specifically that because of a game mechanic actually impacted for this to happen and why we're also seeing this happening in other groups. So let me zoom out here on my scout for ST1. The matchup here, let's, let's break this down. The matchup right now is TFS, EXG, EXXL, BXS versus BXS EIS RTG. This is arguably going to be one of, if not probably the highlight matchup, right? The powerhouse matchup for the T1 season. There are some other good matchups there as well, but just for sake of using this as a nice exhibit A example, because it really show showcases um, the entirety of what we're going to be explaining. So we go into our ST1 group. 
if we go over, oops, hang on, I think that's where, let's, yeah, here we go. So if we go over here to ST134 or ST1-4, you'll see you have BXS, we have EIS, we have LSK, and we have RTG, right? So you have four alliances, four of the main alliances, all going into one starting region on the opposite end. If we go over to Burning Lands, you will see you have EXXL, EXS, EXR, and then in Zoland you have TFS, EXG, EXA, right? Now for the most part, they did split between two, but you could say that like their main force for the main alliances, which is really in this case, right, TFS, EX, uh, EXG, ended up going in to Zoland, right? So for the most part, you could say one and a half. Sure, you, I mean, again, if we're looking at it visually, you could say two regions, but really, really the majority of them went into one. And so then you have to say, okay, well, why is this happening? So let me explain this because there's some logic and some rationale here. Number one. The biggest reason why you're seeing a multiple big alliances, and again, let's show this off so you really understand where we're getting at here, right? So let's look at some boards, right? So you have TFS, almost 15 billion. EIS, BXS are in the same region. TFS, EXG are in the same region. So you have one and four that went to the same region. Two and three and five and uh, nine went to the same region, right? EXXL, uh, RR, EXS, EXA, right? They went to another region. So you can say that the top 10 alliances distributed between three out of six regions, right? Where, specifically, if we look at, let's say, uh, let's say the top five alliances, they split between two regions. Okay, so why is this happening? This is happening really for a few for a few reasons but the most important one is that there was a an update that came out a few updates ago uh, i think two updates ago two to three where and some of you might be familiar with this right this was kind of when that whole betrayal but betrayal meta thing was being talked about this is also when people were advocating or we saw some people advocating for less player movement to happen between alliances so the update comes out and essentially what it says is that you can now not move players. This started in S2+. Plus. You can now not freely move players under what the game's previous mechanic system was, which was if you capture, if you had an alliance from Sephrostia and an alliance from Kaltia go into Hollandale, as long as they had territory in here, right, you could join, uh, you essentially could join uh, another alliance that, uh, excuse me, that was in here, right? Again, you could do the same thing if you capped a behemoth, right? So, but if you were, for example, if I was in Kaltia and I moved over here into Sophrastia, I could capture a behemoth and then people from Sophrastia could come into Kaltia, vice versa. However, if I'm in Kaltia and I flag out into Sophrastia, all I have to do is move my city into Sophrastia and then I can join any alliance in Sophrastia, Right? Which so it kind of works the same way. If you have multiple alliances move into Hollandale, once you have territory that's established and players that have moved in there, you can then join an alliance that's in Hollandale, right? So it's a little bit more movement. That was how it used to work. Now, uh, and again, it may still work like that for some of the earlier seasons, right? Unless that is now applied game wide and excuse me and across. But at least as it pertains to S two plus and T one, which I'm just going to focus on for now is that you can no longer do that. You can only join alliances and move between alliances that you start in the same initial starting or affiliated region with, which means when you're seeing these four alliances here, they're doing it so they're able to union with each other and then also fluidly move between each other regardless of what zone they advance in throughout the season. So some may say that's smart because you're utilizing the system the way that it should be used, right? Or, or using it within the confines of what the current mechanics are. And it makes sense. But the challenge is, is that by doing this, you also limit the potential amount of PvP that you could have in matchups. The other side of it is that 
they probably don't want to stretch out because one, there's no way of knowing where other alliances and other players are going to land. Why? Because you don't have home kingdom starting zones. You have uh, slash, and I should say this uh, uh, right to be uh, to be objective and fair. Slash, you do not have a way to identify publicly in a guaranteed fashion of where other alliances are going to go. Right? Because for the most part, you're already dropping, you're, everyone drops in blind, right? People can tell you whatever they want to tell you, right? They can say, well, I'm going to go to Sephrastia, and then they go somewhere else. They can say they're going to go to Darlin, and they go somewhere else. So, again, the uncertainty of dropping in blind at the moment, because that's what it is, there's no way to know. And so that's, I would say, the second biggest reason on why, you, on why you're seeing more conservative play. We saw this last season in Season 2+. plus where you had TFS going up against Noir. And what did they do, right? The map kind of leans into this west versus east, appro east approach where you had the west, three west zone threes, and you had the east three zone threes, or the east zone threes. And because of that, you saw each of them take a side west and one of the east. And what happened? They didn't end up really fighting until the final zone. And more or less the same thing's going to happen here, except it's just going to happen with a different group of, of alliances. Why? Because that's how this is playing out. And so... This is why it's important to understand that, yes, part of it is a, a, a factor of the map. Part of it is a factor of the game's mechanics. And a part of it is uh, autonomous, right? The, the, the um, anonymity or, or the autonomous individual actions of alliances slash kingdoms. And through them conducting diplomacy. This is another factor. You could arguably almost say it's probably the biggest factor on why it is Alliances are going to go where they are. Now, the reason it's the biggest factor is because they have to operate off of the information that's available to them. And the information available to them is how you ended up arriving at the situation you're in now. Now, if you were to ask all these players and say, hey, are you happy that you're basically more or less going to have to wait until the final zone four, until you can basically start kind of all out PVPing, they're probably going to be like, yeah, no, we're not happy. I would be shocked. If any of the players here, because again, most of these players in these alliances are probably spenders of a varying degree, and I'm sure there's some free-to-play that's mixed in here and there. I know there's at least one free-to-play in TFS, and I'm sure you probably have some, some trickling throughout a couple of these alliances here. Again, if we're just looking at the top five, obviously that increases if you go further on the board to the top ten. And this is, of course, an extreme example of what we're seeing. But this is not the only Season 2 or the T Season T1 Plus or Season T1 slash S2 Plus Plus KVK group that we're seeing this in. And that, to me, is one of the biggest challenges. And so if we go back to the board here for a sec, right, you'll see that, yeah, there could be some potential matchups that you're seeing, but look at all the matchups that have question marks. These matchups that have question marks going into Zone 2 means that there's a, there's a pretty, there's a high percentage chance that the alliance that is versing the question mark is just going to get that zone for free. And they're probably not going to end up facing any action until either zone 3 or more likely zone 4. And you can see right here, there's two zones for this group, right? So that's two out of three. You have two zones or two zone twos for this group, two out of three. Two zones for this group, right? Which again is the one we were just talking about, right? So that's three out of three so far. Two out of three here, that's four out of four. Two question marks here out of three zone twos, that's five out of five, right? You have this one, which is only one, right? So I'll kind of give that to them. You have a second one here. You have another one, right? So this is six out of eight. And then you get to the last one. So seven out of nine of the T1 KVK groups are trending in a direction of where you're going to end up seeing a number of, of what could be free Zone 2 captures from alliances with a number of these groups, the majority of them, that are probably not going to be seeing decent action until Zone 3, if not more likely Zone 4. And so, again, there is reasons for why this is happening. If we look close enough, if we analyze and we look at what previous updates we're bringing, what mechanical changes happened, if we're understanding player psychology and how diplomacy is being played out and why choices and actions are being done, we can arrive at a logical and rational conclusion. And so this is why I say, right, when you ended up having people that were saying, oh, the map is, is, is what's going to solve it, it's going to bring it all back. I mean, it's a yes and no, right? It's not black and white. There is some gray area. And we have to understand that if we want to be able to improve the game as a whole. Now, if you were to sit down and ask me and say, hey, boss, okay, well, what do you think are some 
answers. What do you think is something that's going to really solve this? Well, I think there's a few things that can solve this, right? I, for one, like the direction that the Season 1 Plus map or the Season 2 Plus Plus slash T1 map is going in, which is essentially an abridged or an adjusted version from the Season 1 Plus map. I also like the way that Season 2 Plus map was looking, um, again, but they obviously needed to add a few more things. I think a few more neutral PvP zones. I think shortening the timelines on the Augur Stone um, to where you end up having the zones that are opening up a little bit more, but that should be based on data on how the alliances are filling the territory out, right? And I'll, I'll give you an example. So if we're looking at the zones here, so I'll give you my few, right? Number one, I think you have to be able to look at the Augur Stone chapter and say to yourself, so let's look, right? We, we're on the third Augur Stone chapter, we have two more chapters, right? So this has seven and a half hours. Let's assume each of these are two days, right? So that's th about three and a half days plus the 12 hours until this opens, right? So we're looking at, or I'm sorry, what did I say? Three and a half, four and a half days, right? So you're looking at almost five days, a little bit less than five days until the pass opens. If we're just going off of a conservative number for two days, right? Or somewhat mid-range. And then we look at, okay, well, how are the alliances filling out the area? Well, I can make an argument and say that Sophrastia is pretty much almost filled out. I could say Kaltia, okay, probably probably needs a couple more days, right, until that's done. Let's look at Burning Lands. Okay, Burning Lands might need a day or two, right, to fill out some more territory, maybe two to three, but I don't think it needs five more days. If we look at Zoland, I think Zoland, okay, you probably only need maybe another day. I mean, most of the Spires have been captured. Most of the, uh, the alliances are already at the Behemoths, right, maybe a day more. If we look at... Some of the other regions that have some people in it, which again, Darlin, there's not too much activity. And obviously, depending on how many active players the alliances have in, will also factor in how quickly they're able to fill the areas out. But I think if you look at Nivola, okay, right? There's not that much movement that's happening here. So maybe a couple more days. But I think it's more accurate to look at the regions that have healthy and active alliances, right? So I think Sophrastia, um, obviously Burning Lands, um, and, and Zoland, and then Kaltia would probably be the next along with... Uh, Nivola up here, right? But I think those three regions are showing us already that most of the territory is already filled out. You don't necessarily need that much time. And that doesn't mean that we need to drastically shrink how quickly Zone 2 opens. And it's not to say that we necessarily need to maybe shorten the season. It's not that I'm against shortening the season, but I just think you have to be, I think you need to look at the data across multiple KVKs and you need to see how quickly our active alliance is filling out the territory within the starting zone ones and each of the zones for that matter. And then look at adjusting appropriately, right? Because really that's what you should be going off of, right? As long as the alliances are active, how quickly are they filling out the territory and then how much time do they have left over once the territory is filled out? Uh, until the next zone opens, right? And you can also factor that in with when you're going to open Behemoths, and maybe you adjust that a little bit. Um, and then I'd say the second thing here is I truly believe we need to revert back to what the free healing was. I think they need to revert back to the free healing um, because, again, it still has seen a nerf, right? If you remember, they basically did a big nerf to free healing. They, they rolled it back a little bit, but they didn't roll it back all the way. My view on this is I would actually love to see them revert it all the way back to what it was pre-nerf and then potentially increase it a bit. Maybe not a lot, right? Maybe 10%, give or take, right? So you obviously start small and you can kind of work from there. Because the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is alliances are waiting arguably a whole season. This is a consistent trend, right? This was happening in season two, it was happening in two plus, and it's probably gonna happen in T1, right? And it was happening in one plus two as well, right? So the past three KVK seasons, we've been consistently seeing this, where a number of KVKs are basically waiting until arguably the final zone or the second to last final zone, uh, and then they're fighting it out. But the majority of the time, the fights are only lasting about two days, right? 48 hours, give or take. So you, you're going to tell me that they're hanging out here, waiting for a month to a month and a half, you know, at minimum, to then fight for two days. And again, that's not everyone. Like I said, that's the average right now. There are some groups, like we saw last season, when you look at TFS and Noir, they basically fought for weeks, right? Um, or, or you could say they fought consistently for a week to two, right? One to two weeks, where we were seeing consistent action. You can see GG and TA, they were fighting consistently. If you look at the OG, the EIS, the VVV, um, and the SK and the, tri and the Tribe group, right, they were fighting.
for a while. So there are a few examples, but this is not the average on what's happening. Uh, and so, like I said, that's point number two for me. I think the third one is that having home kingdom starting zones, I think, would help a lot. Because it would remove this blind drop aspect that we basically have right now. And if you know where kingdoms are going, whether, and you can do this a couple of different ways. My view, and something I would, and, and, and I say this because I think it's important to test. Trial and error is very important. So you can do this, I think, three different ways. Number one, you can have home kingdoms be randomized for where they start. That's one. Number two, you can have kingdoms that will do some type of an EOTC event, Eve of the Crusade for those for my rock fam out there, where they basically participate in some type of kingdom-wide ranking event going into that KVK. And what that means is that you're competing against other kingdoms that are going to be in your KVK. Maybe it lasts a couple days. Um, I don't think it needs to last more than a week. I mean, probably like somewhere like three to five days, I think is a good number somewhere in there. And basically each day you compete, you would do things like... Um, who can kill the most Darklings, who can do the most forts, who can gather the most RSS, right? Things that you would look at competing appropriately, right? Maybe who can gain the most power, a, a, a couple things. It doesn't need to be overwhelming. And then depending on where each person is placed, so like let's say whoever placed first, okay, well, you'll go into this starting zone. Whoever places second, you'll go into this starting zone, right? So it's more fixed. And then I think the third way that it can be done, and this is the way I actually like out of all of these options, and I'm sure some of you might have options as well, I'd love to hear. But the third option I'm going to give you is I like this idea of applying an EOTC type event with the exception of that once the rankings are done, depending on where you rank, you can select what starting region your kingdom goes to, right? So an example here, if you have six starting zone ones, or uh, excuse me, um, no, it is six. I'm, 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 I'm having a, a, a blonde moment right now, but this is just for ST1 in this example. You have six starting zone one regions. Let's say that you're going to have six kingdoms going in here, right? What you would do is depending on who placed one through six, if you place in first, you get first selection. You get to choose where you go. And then the number two, the number two kingdom gets to choose where they go right? And you can see where everyone chooses, right? That to me would be awesome. And then obviously the question comes in, okay, well, boss, what if there's more than six kingdoms that go into a, uh, a starting zone? Okay. Well, if that's the case, then you would do a first round, right? Of the six kingdoms where people can go. And then you do the next round, right? So then the next six would select where they go. And you can have multiple kingdoms in the same. Now, you can do it that way. You could do it where maybe you give each king, each starting zone a limit, right? So maybe they can only have, like, let's say you put 12 kingdoms in the ST1 KVK. And then you'd say, okay, well, each region can only have a max of two kingdoms going there, right? So you could say the first and the second kingdom go there. Third kingdom goes somewhere else. The fourth and the fifth kingdom go somewhere uh, or the sixth and the ninth kingdom, right? You can do it like that too. But the point is, is that you applying some trial and error is okay and seeing what may work and what doesn't work. But the biggest challenge right now is that, and, and this is where it comes in, right? If you allow the choice to be done by the players, the map and the mechanics have to be in favor and it has to be something that will incentivize alliances to want to fight in the early zones, right? Because, again, and, and then I would also revert the change. I would allow for alliances. I mean, this thing, if you have home kingdom starting zones, it, it doesn't really matter because you're going to be joining alliances within your home kingdom, right? You're not going to join alliances that are outside of your kingdom. So the whole point is to, is to implement features and systems to where it incentivizes kingdoms to start in particular zones that will allow for them to fight more right in those neutral zones and so this is where like one of the things you have to think about is that if you have multiple alliances that start in like Sephrostia or, or sorry if you have a kingdom that starts here two kingdoms in Sephrostia and then you have different kingdoms in Nivola 
The challenge is, is you may meet in zone three, or I'm sorry, I guess I'd have to give you the example of like Kaltia and Sephrostia, right? Sure, you might be able to go into your adjacent zone twos, but you're gonna end up meeting in zone three. So that that really is one of the big problems is that you could almost make the argument, why not have more zone threes, right? Why not have six zone threes, right? Why not have as many zone threes as you have zone ones? Now, some people may look at may hear that and say, well, you know, why do that? Because the idea is, you know, maybe you're trying to shrink those so you can have, okay, well, I mean, on one side, that, that's true, right? You want to have alliances kind of vie and fight for that. But one of, but you have to also look at it from the other side. If you have a limited amount of zone threes, you can make the argument that the crescendo of PvP for a number of groups is going to end at zone three. We saw this happen the last two seasons. In season two, we saw this happen in two plus, where basically the pinnacle fighting for those KVKs was in zone three. It wasn't in the final zone. And because of that, we saw either mismatches or extreme advantages or disadvantages going towards one side or another. And this was something I covered. And that's also something you have to consider. So this is why when you're, and again, I'm, I'm only kind of scraping the surface. I wasn't expecting for this to be a 30 minute plus video because there is a lot to talk about. And there's a lot of particulars that you can look at different areas of how a map is designed, understanding why it is that we're seeing peak PVP happening at certain points. How do you really make the best of both worlds? And there's quite a bit, right? And I think taking time to think about these things playing out the scenarios, understanding the in and outs, kind of picking it apart and putting it back together is important and having healthy discussions around this. And like I said, I think some of the options I've provided, I think are good solutions. I do also think that some of them need a little bit more time to marinate and to think about. And also, you know, obviously having these kinds of discussions in this kind of an open way, even just for me talking about it here and kind of running it through my head, you know, allows for me to even try and think about it from different perspectives. So, it, the point overall is that there's a lot that goes into it. And I hope if anything, I've had a chance to convey that to you. And hopefully some of you enjoy that. Uh, and if you've made it this long, I'd love to know what you think, right? Um, if some of the points that I made or some of the ideas and potential solutions I brought up make sense, did you maybe get inspired uh, and think of a variation or an adaptation to something I mentioned? Do you have your own thought? on it as well, on how to solve it. Is this something that has been illuminating to you when you think about all the factors that go into why or why not we're seeing consistent and good sustainable PVP throughout an entire season or why we're only seeing PVP happening in the final zone or the second to final zone more or less and then it's over. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because this is, these are the kind of topics that I just find absolutely fascinating. I, I can talk about these for days. Um, you know, especially when you look at the data and you look at the trends, there's, uh, these things are very interesting. And it's one of the things I love so much about Kingdom Builders. One of the reasons why this is one of my favorite genres to be a part of and to create content for. Okay, that's going to be it for me. I feel like I'm just rambling at this point here at the end. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. And of course, gals, we're gender neutral as always. And yeah, with that being said, I'm out. Until next time, I'll catch y'all later.